Today we got the man, Steve Hall, AKA we got stronger. I wanted to have you on the podcast because I've been following you for a long time. I hired you to coach me for the, for the next show and I've seen your progress, man. And every time I see you, it's like, Hey, this guy is just so consistent. I see your progress year after year and it's, it's very, very inspiring. And I also, and I also know you got uh, second place last year in the WNBF world's finals. So that's sounds like a pretty big deal in the bodybuilding world. Um, so yeah, man, um, that's my quick intro. I'll let you also intro yourself. Cause I know you do a better job of that, of that than me. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but thank you so much, Julian. I, I appreciate all the kind words. Uh, I'm always terrible at this. I try and be as humble as possible. And like, I wouldn't have this big grin on my face, but whenever, on, whenever anyone gives me props, I'm just like smiling like a way. I'm just like, oh, that's so nice. Uh, so I, I highly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I appreciate being invited on and um, also honored to be in your corner coaching you because it's not like you don't know your shit. So it's nice to be kind of on in your corner and helping you kind of get even better results, hopefully. Awesome, man. So I got some questions about, you know, your bodybuilding career. I know you've been doing this for quite some time. How many years since you started? Yeah, I realized I didn't actually give like an intro to uh, who I am at all. But so I'll give it, you can do it now. <laughs> yeah, I can give it a little bit now. So I've been competing since 2014. So yeah, soon enough, I'll be having been a like competitive bodybuilder for 10 years, a decade. So that'd be crazy. And my last season, I did 2017 and then I did my last season 2021 and I've had this kind of just nice progression. I would say, I don't know how typical it is for a bodybuilder to go through like the novice ranks and just be like, I was kind of like a okay novice. Like I place in the top three, maybe actually, you know, I placed in the top four. That was my best. Uh, so like not amazing. And then my next season, I managed to go get into the open class and get to a British final or a few British finals. And I did place in the top three at one of those top five at the better one. So no, by no means was I like a great bodybuilder, but then this past season, I, I managed to really improve in my kind of, I would call it improvement season off season, as it were, where you said kind of I made uh, and like you were kind of talking about me and how I'd made a lot of progress and I did manage to make a lot of progress and so this last season was much better and I actually managed to get to the WMBF which would be the the largest natural federation their world finals and I came second as an amateur so I'm not a pro like there's even another league above You're so me. close <laughs> I did get close to going pro that's absolutely true so I could have like yeah it would have been really cool to have done that but like you know at the end of the day we do this because we love like the pursuit of bodybuilding versus like that trophy like I've got a plastic yeah. trophy over here it's like what does that really mean it's just like this lump of metal really it's cool to have the memories the photos and I just enjoy and love the process of it and I've been doing it basically been training since I was about 16 years old so I'm now 32, How old are you now? 32. Okay. so a long life, time man. That's, yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's crazy. <laughs> and I think that that's really important to put things in perspective because I get, you know, I, we have mostly really beginner clients in, in, in my coaching program. And a lot of people come and they're just like, I want to step on stage, but they don't really understand like the level of commitment, effort and time that it takes to build a body. So yeah. the fact that you've spent half of your life working towards it just speaks volumes about, you know, what it takes to get to the, be one of the best in the world at natural bodybuilding. So that's, that's awesome, man. Um, so you said that the last improvement seems as you made the most amount of progress. Do you feel like, do you do anything differently or do you feel like it was just the outcome of all the consistency throughout the years that just kind of, you, you were able to see it like yeah. in the last season? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because I think uh, a lot of people have the misconception that you basically make almost 90 80 90 percent or maybe probably 90 plus even after like two three four years of training and in reality anyone who like first gets into this we aren't doing everything right we're doing absolutely tons wrong and we get results despite of that because we're just a, like a newbie and you can do so much wrong as a kind of new lifter and still see results and then once you get to that kind of intermediate level after like a few years you're like man like I can't do what I used to do and still see results. You have to start taking care of like the, the principles, specificity, fatigue management, overload, progressive overload, and taking care of rest days and sleep and thinking more about your nutrition, being in a surplus, maybe if you really want to grow some muscle. And a lot of people just don't get to that point because it's it actually that initial kind of learning curve is quite like, a, it's a big one. I think we take it for granted that it's very simple for us. We just do it day in, day out. But 
when I first got into things, I was so lost. I was like, oh, clean eating is what I need to do. Just eat loads of protein and I'll gain loads of muscle and not loads of fat. And I got like, I gained a lot of weight in a short period of time and it wasn't good weight by any means. So I certainly had lots of trial and error in the years previous. And I did a lot of things like, right, I was always training hard, consistently eating lots of protein, lots of food generally. But then you kind of, when you do get over fat a little bit, when you cut down, you then get a bit worried about gaining fat again. And you think, oh, maybe I can do this recomp thing. You get a bit lost in information. You're like, oh, people say recomping works. I can just eat a maintenance, lose fat, gain muscle. And so I think it just takes time and it depends on the person. And I think getting a coach really helps. Like if you get a coach early, a good one, they can really help. Again, if you don't get a good coach and you might not even know who's a good coach versus a bad one, they could set you in the other direction or take you yeah. down a, a route you don't even want to go down. So it's so challenging. So I can't say I necessarily did anything inherently different in that off season. I just think I honed my craft so much better. And I kind of gave myself a bit of like a talking to in, in the sense of the progress I made from 2014 to 2017 wasn't that large. Like I, I actually went into the open class and I did better as a bodybuilder, but I didn't think my physique changed as much as maybe it should have. And I think I set up some limitations in my mind where I was like, oh, as a natural advanced bodybuilder, I thought I was this person. I could only gain a pound of muscle a year. So I should really try and slowly gain and like be in a tiny surplus. So I just got over myself with that. And I was like, no, if muscle gain is really hard, I need to make sure I'm in a surplus to make it as easy as possible. So I actually gain a decent amount of weight. I also did push my body weight up to new highs that I'd never got to before. I always capped myself at 190 pounds. That was like the max weight I could ever be. And I'm sitting over 190 pounds now. And it's like, nice. man, why did I, yeah, why did I cap myself there? So I pushed to 200 and beyond. And I think just putting myself in that surplus, that extended period of time, focusing on training performance, progressive overload, just kind of led to I put myself in an environment for growth basically whereas before I was kind of like I don't know it's this plant that you have barely in the sun you're not really watering it very well and you're not taking care of it and you expect it to kind of grow well and it's not really growing and it's not flourishing whereas I did the opposite in this off season where I was like right I'm going to put myself in all the conditions so I can't fail but to grow and again like I said in terms of honing my craft I just learned more about kind of what exercises worked well for me what volumes I can deal with and manage and kind of recover from. But it was also, like you said, consistently applying all the things that we know work and not straying too far away from those general principles. I just individualized them to me a little bit better and was a little bit more adherent to some of them as well, like being in a calorie surplus and actually making sure I'm gaining weight and getting out of my way, own way. Like I had my own like psychological issues in terms of gaining body fat and doing that and i was just like right let's remove that let's kind of stay a bit more objective stay a bit more rational and basically do the things that we know we all should be doing and i was just better at doing those over and over again so yeah that's that was probably the the thing i did this time around so it sounds like the biggest the biggest change you had was allowing yourself not not being scared of just putting on more weight and that by itself led to increasing your muscle mass how, how long do you think an off season should last for natural lifters, like both like male and female? Because some people just want to, I know that beginners probably can, you know, a couple months is fine, but once you get past intermediate advanced, like how long do you think they need to plan before they actually want to compete again? It's a really good question because especially as a natural, I, I joked about how slow muscle gain is, but it is really slow. <laughs> like it, it is like watching paint dry. Like it, it isn't something where, I don't know, in two months, if I take my kind of body pictures again, I'm not going to see, oh, I've gained muscle there, there, there. I'm going to be like, oh, I gained a bit of body fat uh, here, here, and here, and I just look a bit softer. And so it's it can be kind of demoralizing from that point, but you just have to realize that it is a slow process. And I think once you compete, you should be kind of well-developed, have the probably the majority of the muscle mass you're going to have as a lifter. So probably having done uh, as a male bodybuilder, I would say at least like three to four years of very principle-based, dedicated training, nutrition, everything on point. So you might have had three years before that as well. That's like been dog shit or like kind of decent, yeah. kind of kind of not the best. But you want to at least have had some time. So you've kind of got muscle to show on stage otherwise. And you've gone through some dieting phases. So you know what that's like. So now at that point, you're still early in your lifting career. So if you were to compete again, like the next year, you have to also consider there's a recovery phase from dieting in that 
when you take yourself to that level of extreme body fat, you dieted maybe for four to six months or something to get there. There's then like the aftermath afterwards. It's not like after a month of just like good eating after the show and you bring your body fat up, you still aren't fully recovered from that. And you're certainly not gaining any new muscle tissue. So it might be another like four to six months after the contest prep where you start feeling pretty good again, you start hitting PRs and things, depending on kind of what your contest prep is look like. Hopefully it's like a couple of months. I think that would be a good position to be in. That's what I felt like for me, it took a couple of months before I was like actually improving into my next off season again and making new muscle gains and things like this. But then that's already like into the year. And then you've only got a short period of time before, again, you can't push your body fat up too high you can't kind of be in a surplus too long because you need to start dieting again for the next year. So that window of opportunity for muscle gain is just so slow if you try and do it every year. So then if you consider maybe every other year, at least that gives you like a probably dedicated year of growth, which I think could be really good. So I'd at least like, I, I wouldn't recommend people who have still gains on the table. And I would say that's anyone who's in their like early ish years of their bodybuilding career and also them as an individual. It's hard to say because like I'd, I'd look at some people and they might have been doing it for an extended period of time, but I might still look at them and be like, oh, there's so much more you could do to improve. Yeah. But at my stage, I feel like I've still got plenty on the table to bring. So I wouldn't want to compete like every year because I think the person competing every year is the person who's almost at their genetic limit. Like they're almost at that ceiling. They're maybe in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, where it's like, realistically, are you going to improve in terms of building muscle? probably not at that point because you've probably been doing it for like two three decades by now in terms of lifting so maybe you can compete every year then scale it back so anyone who is like i don't know in their late 20s early 30s and been doing it like a decade or so every two to three years like competing i think is great and earlier in your bodybuilding career the longer you want to spend kind of in your gaining periods because you've got so much more muscle to gain and so much more potential there to improve so it just kind of uh, yeah, kind of they coordinate like that. The longer you've been doing it, the less you have to gain, the more you want to compete, but equally the other way around, like the earlier you are in your career, the longer periods you want between. Because yeah, for me, people are asking like, am I going to compete? Like they're itchy even asking to compete this year. And I think people don't understand like natural bodybuilding and the extremes you would have to go through in the kind of period of unhealthy, like you are unhealthy yeah. at that period of time. I think even as an enhanced bodybuilder, it's tough to compete every year probably and make significant improvements. Like every, at least like every other year, I think probably be far more productive, but yeah, that's how I'd kind of scale it. So scale it to your training age and your actual age and where you are with it all. So if people know someone like Jeff Alberts from 3DMJ, he's like, he's at the peak of his career. He's gained like all the muscle mass he's probably ever going to gain. And so if he can just hover a bit above stage weight, that's comfortable with him, he feels good. He can just like compete probably quite regularly and do really well like that because he can kind of milk out that physique he's built. But for someone like me, I still need to gain muscle to be more competitive. And that requires time away from the stage, time at a higher body fat where I can be productive and train in the gym well. So it so sounds like 12 to 18 months is it's kind of like the minimum that, that it, yeah. you, you recommend before you do another show. And I think that that makes total sense. Now, bodybuilding, man, um, what kind of like mental challenges have you faced during this career? And how do you deal with them? <laughs> it's a good question, man. There's, uh, there's a lot of mental challenges, like even in you your... Say the, the biggest ones, like the ones that you feel that most yeah. current come your way. I think probably the biggest one I personally have faced at various times is like self-doubt and comparing yourself to others. I think we all go through that and they say comparison's the thief of joy. And it's so true because especially we're of the age where it's like social media has almost been there since our teens. And so it's like been our whole like bodybuilding career has almost been with social media. Yeah. And so we're inherently comparing ourselves to the people we see on this platform and the people you see are the ones who are the most attractive, the most jacked, the most extreme, the ones to aspire to. And I can remember when I first got into it, Matt August was like the person I'd look up to. And I just, I couldn't even, I didn't think he was natural at the time because I was like, man, I can't imagine ever getting to look like that or any, like any semblance of getting close to that. And as I started doing it more and doing it better, I realized, oh, maybe actually there is more to this and I, I can get closer. But it's just so challenging at times because you end up also doubting your methods and methodologies too, because you see some guy who looks like he's doing some very questionable things. You're like, really, can you grow doing like, I don't know, that little volume training 
that weird exercise and don't know training beyond failure and I don't know doing all these risky things and strange things you're just like man he barely takes care of his nutrition but he's more jacked than me maybe I'm doing something wrong you start doubting yourself questioning your methods and I always just like to bring myself back to like okay so we have this thing like science which kind of proves and disproves things and gives us some kind of roots towards how things should be and that's probably the uh, kind of the most direct and uh, the the greatest and more most likely way to get towards the truth of how to do things if i just kind of pick i could pick a r- bunch of random bros and like they could all be doing different things and i have to think okay what where do they cross lines what kind of what things are they doing that is similar what can i i pull from that and then kind of draw from them the principles and see how they're kind of putting those into practice and then be like okay so am i doing this am i applying to that the, to the best of my ability where have I come from in terms of like where have I started to to where I am now and be confident about my process and what I'm doing here and I am seeing results if you're not seeing results then yeah you should maybe doubt yourself maybe look towards other try and get some education maybe get a coach but it can be really hard uh, because I think a lot of people especially competitors like yourself as well Julian like we invest so much into this that like if we have doubts and we you can feel insecure about yourself at times like it's not very nice but the easiest thing you can do, I always use this sort of example where if you're on holiday and you just go to a, a random beach, you take your top off and then you look around and you'll be like, I'm the most jacked yeah. person here. Like nine times out of ten, unless you're also on the beach with me, Julian, I'll be like, I'm the most jacked person here. Uh, there'll be someone else, unless there's some other kind of uh, bodybuilding freak on the on the, the beach. Like by far, you're more, more, like, more than likely the most jacked person there. So we kind of get into this little bubble of social media and comparison to the elite that we forget that, man, we're like 1% of the population that really lifts and is dedicated maybe a decade to it or many years. We're way above average at this point, or even if you've been doing it half the time we have, you're still way above average because the majority of people don't lift. And so that kind of gives you a sense of confidence. Again, it's that comparison's the thief of joy, but sometimes that comparison to like the actual average and the real life population can help bring you kind of uh, back to a place of like, oh, actually, like I do look like I lift, <laughs> just not compared to these kind of huge individuals out there. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think so I'd say that go. that's one of the yeah, biggest we- challenges. Yeah, and I, and I feel you completely, man. I, I feel the same way. And we tend to forget how, because we, we've done things right, I believe, in the, you know, in the past years. We tend to forget how important genetics are to getting to top level or class athlete in any sport. Like, if you don't have the genetics, then it, you, no matter what you do, you will not make it. So I think it's important to remember that. Yeah, it's an example I always, people seem to, I don't know why for, and I did this for myself with bodybuilding, because I think there are people out there probably with amazing genetics and they all say, like, if you put in enough hard work and effort, you can get to where I am. And I'm just like, I used to believe that as a kid. And I think that's a great belief to have because it's like not limiting but you come to realize the majority of people who are average and not this freak, you, you'll become to realize that no matter what you do, you'll never get to be like them. It's just not going to happen. And there's so many good examples of that in other sports where if you were to say, oh, don't, don't worry, if you work hard enough, you'll be as fast as Usain Bolt. It's like, no, you fucking never will be as fast as Usain Bolt. <laughs> like the comes from a very specific like niche of population within Jamaica that have like the gen- genes to be the fastest individuals on the planet. And anyone else who's like got close to running that fast, again, have these specific genes. It's like, if you're just some random dude on the street, like, yeah, go, yeah. go follow Usain Bolt's program. You'll be as fast <laughs> as him no, in no time. It's just not going to happen. So you're completely right. People. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the hard work, man. Like for me, I, I tend to question myself, like, am I working hard enough? Like, yeah. what else do I need to do? Like, I'm, I feel like I'm killing myself in the gym. And then it can also get unhealthy because then you do more than you can and then you you end up just going backwards so i think the hard work is a good mindset to have but i don't know like how do you balance that man how do you how do you tell your clients about that like hard work versus like what you actually need to do yeah it's a hard one because i often see it spoken about how and i think it's actually great advance to advice sorry to the vast majority of lifters is the vast majority of lifters need to work harder they need to train harder They maybe need to do more volume. They need to be better and more diligent with their macros. But for the population that I work with, that advice is almost backwards. 
more often than not, they're doing too much volume. They're normally driving themselves into the ground, causing too much fatigue. And they're like too obsessed with their macros and they need to draw back. They need to enjoy life a little bit more and make this more of a lifestyle for them. Like, yeah, I, I was, to I'm still probably pretty bad at this myself, to be honest, but I find myself drawing clients back from themselves. And like, there's a time and place for those sort of things. Like for you yeah. and prep, like you need to be pretty hyper-focused because you've got a short-term goal that's coming. You need to make sure you're, you're on track, but for this to be a productive lifestyle in your off seasons, improvement seasons, you need to be enjoying like the process of it. If someone asks, if you want to go out for a meal or if you're single and want to go on a date, you're not going to be like, oh, no, I can't stay out past like 9 p.m. I need to get my sleep. It's like, well, fucking hell. Like maybe if you got legs tomorrow and it's overreaching week, but <laughs> if it's like a general week, you know, like you can live a little. And um, yeah, I think it, it's hard because yeah, they just look at these people, like inevitably we get into that also position, especially recently I found a lot of my athletes were like, okay, so volume is a key driver of growth. More is better. So I, I must just always do more. And inevitably when you go into that extreme it like it takes away from other things so potentially their quality starts dipping their intensity can't be as good because they're just spreading themselves too thinly so there's definitely a fine line because like there's the stress response if you just keep over stressing things you can't respond adapt and get better so if you do too much volume you're not actually allowing yourself to grow if you don't have rest days that's where the actual growth and recovery and things are happening like you have to prioritize sleep. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And this, I mean, it all stems like from bodybuilding in many ways where it's like hard work is better. And he's like talking about like how he he was like sleep faster. I remember him, <laughs> him quoted that recently, even actually where he was like, oh, someone said to me, they need eight, nine hours of sleep. So they can't get, I don't know, whatever they need to get done during the day. He was like, sleep faster, do it in five to seven hours and have more time in your day. It's like, it's almost backwards for growth. Sleep is so important. Yeah. It improves every outcome. So there's definitely this balancing act where it's like, you have to sometimes I talk about it like a dog on a leash. Like you don't want to just like let the dog off and just give them complete freedom. We also don't want to keep them so tight that they can't like rummage around and find discover and find things out for themselves. There's that kind of middle ground where you're just like, as a coach, I guess you're like the bumpers on like a bowling alley. Like you're trying to keep them like in there and guide them no, towards a strike. Yeah. I love that, man. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to I wanna talk a little bit about, about contest prep because I think that especially someone that's never competed, it happened to me. Like the first time I competed, I was like, holy shit, this is really hard. Uh, like I had, I, I learned to have so much respect for like bodybuilders because like, I don't think people know how, how hard dieting is to do really low levels of body fat. So I want, I want you to tell your experience about, you know, off getting into those really, really, really low levels of body fat where you look right on stage. Like, how does that feel to you? Yeah. So again, this is one of the ones when you haven't gone through it, it's really hard to understand it. And this is where, because people argue like you could, I, I do think there are coaches who have never competed before can take a client to stage. But if you've had that experience getting to stage, it's like such an invaluable experience. I bring it up, I don't know if, if you have never fainted before, then if someone tells you what fainting feels like, you're like, yeah, I, I think I get that. But once you faint, you're like, holy shit, what the fuck? Like my body just switched off. That was so weird. Like you, it's something you have to almost feel and experience. So like if someone's just dieted before, I mean, sure, like you've had some semblance of what it feels like, but it's to a whole nother extreme. Uh, like in terms of taking yourself to stage as a bodybuilder, it's like controlled starvation, self-imposed starvation. Of course, the goal is not to starve yourself. You want to also maintain muscle mass and you know, have good training performance. But then that's where the balancing act comes in because it'll be easy just to lose like 30 pounds and not worry about also holding on to muscle because then you would just like push yourself into like a hole and obviously you'll feel like crap. But you don't have to worry about kind of maintaining a level of performance, which you're trying to hold off season levels of performance and during a contest prep, that could be super challenging when you haven't got the fuel in there to provide the energy for that. You're now a smaller individual. You haven't got the fat to like buffer the kind of loads that you're going to be using within the gym. So it all just becomes such a harder thing. And it's a level, it's an extreme sport. It's kind of like comparing, I don't know, like driving on the motorway or on the highway versus like Formula One racing. Like it's just a completely different ball yeah. game to dieting. And it's such a more extreme thing to be doing. And it's something your body doesn't want to do. That's the hardest part, I think, that for people to get their head around as well is that you are imposing measures on yourself 
the body just does not want to do. It doesn't want to get that lean. It's not a healthy level of leanness either. And again, this is where social media doesn't help because people see us on stage smiling and like look at the peak of health and fitness. And it's like, it couldn't be any like diff, like, like we don't, we don't have a libido. Uh, we like have terrible sleep. Our hunger levels are just complete out of whack. We could eat like 10,000 calories and it wouldn't even like make us stuffed or full or we wouldn't feel uncomfortable about it. Like it would just be, um, it's completely away from what is the norm and what is healthy. So yeah, just, it, it knocks people differently though. So again, like, I think this is a big part of genetics in that if you are someone who is just genetically a leaner individual, you tend to find you can kind of get to a point, a uh, level of leanness that is much more comfortable for you. And then you don't have to dig that much lower than that. And so it's not as big an extreme, but if you're someone who doesn't feel comfortable, unless they like, I don't know, you're 15% body fat, anything leaner than that, you start feeling hungry to like tired, not great. Getting to stage condition where you're close to like five, 7% body fat, you've got lines in your ass, like that's really uncomfortable. And that gets really, really challenging. And to function, and I think this is where my respect for bodybuilders came in because it's not like we're paid athletes and this is all we do and we can kind of train, eat, and then just like do our bodybuilding and sleep. We have to also do jobs. So if I have clients, like I had a client who competed recently, he's a nurse. So he works like on his feet all day in the ward, helping oh. people, talking to lots of people. And he has to somehow do all of that, like his usual day job, train really hard, to maintain the muscle mass, like have the time to prep his meals. And then he's like, he has a girlfriend who of course that makes it challenging at times if they don't understand or they don't realize that there are certain amounts of things that are gonna kind of go by the wayside that maybe you had in your relationship before in terms of intimacy, that can be really challenging. So it's so hard to balance. And there is this point of which like the diet, like, you know, this probably Julian where you're in that kind of like, oh yeah, dieting's like fine, it's okay. And then like, so it's not shit hits the fan, but it's almost that way where it's just like everything's now getting harder. Like even just walking, I think like that's something hey, you don't you want to move. You're like, yeah. I remember, <laughs> I remember last Fred, like I, I had a pen in my hand and he dropped it. I was like, I don't want to move to pick it up. It's going to stay <laughs> on the fucking ground. Like, and I, so much respect for your client, man, because I remember the last show we did, we wanted, we had never competed before. So we had a bunch of people over at the house the day of the show. We had like someone to help us like record a YouTube video and yeah. then people wanted to see us before the show. And when all these people got there, I was like, I don't want to see anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> Please just leave my house. I want to lay down and chill and not have to make any effort until the show. Like it, it's really hard to describe that feeling if you yeah. haven't experienced it. And I, I played, uh, I played soccer in college. It was, you know, we're, we're kind of held to like a high, high standards, but even when you're a professional player of another sport, you get breaks. Like you, you're out of the match and then you can go eat and you can have fun and then you got training. But here it's like 24 seven. You're like in a diet yeah. all the, every single day for six months. You don't want to, you can't go out. To, you can't do anything. Just do the prep until you get. To, so it's really, really, really challenging. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I can't think exactly how the neat like this looks, but it's people probably know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is like, what a human needs to like live a healthy and fulfilled life and you just get so many of these things removed when you're in contest prep and so you just become this almost you want to become this hermit but that's not okay in like day-to-day -day society i think about the number of people i've heard of actually horror stories not horror stories sounds a bit <laughs> like like if really bad things happened but like people have broken up with their partners because yeah. they simply like have just gone into their shell and you become this you become a different person you probably experienced this where you, you almost don't, I don't like myself when I'm yep. like within like the 10 to 15 week period where I'm just this yeah. like, kind of like this asshole where I'm just like, that's not a nice person. Like they're so selfish thinking about themselves all the time. Like so image focused, how they're looking. Like it doesn't matter about whatever other worries are going on in other people's lives. You just become so apathetic and like you, your kind of girlfriend comes in and just like tells you about their bad day or whatever. You're like, fucking hell. I just don't like, you just don't care. You're like, I'm starving here. Like I'm like 5% body fat. Like you can't be going through anything as bad as me. And it's like, that's such a selfish, horrible mindset to have. It's self-imposed too. And that's something as a coach, you always have to remind your clients of and anyone competing to remind yourself of is just like, 
I'm choosing to do this. And that's what the warped thing is, right? Like we're completely yeah. crazy. <laughs> we want to take yourself <laughs> like it's self-imposed starving. Like, why do we do this to ourselves? I mean, that's why some people are just like, I'm going to be a power lifter because I get to eat plenty and just lift big. It sounds much more fun than like, actually, like, do you want to eat this extra, I don't know, spoonful of oats or whatever? It's like, no, I can't. There's too many, too many calories. So what? <laughs> and the um, thing is, you don't even notice it. Like while you're in in there no. you don't notice how much of an asshole you become how much how like how moody you are until like two, like eight weeks post show when you're like coming back to Milan, it was like what the f like what what why was i behaving like that like doesn't make any sense but when you're in there you don't it just it feels like it is right i don't know like that's the best way i can describe it man it's yeah it's, it's something again you don't really understand it until you go through it because I know this time around that like if me and my girlfriend have an argument, like I'm always, if I'm in prep, I'm just like, you're, you're right. I'm wrong in my head. I don't think that I think I'm right. Absolutely. 100%. But I know <laughs> I'm like not someone being rational or objective at that point. And if I wasn't in prep, I would think she's probably right. So I just kind of like default always think I'm the person. Uh, I don't think I'm wrong, but I say it to her because I'm like, I, I know because I can't be rational at this point. Like, because like you said, you always think in that situation, it's normal and you're fine. And like, you're not being an asshole. But if someone says you are being one, you're very likely like being one, even if you really in your heart of hearts don't feel that way. I even remember having a discussion with her where we had that sort of argument. I was like, you're right. I really am struggling to believe that you're right. But I'm going to say you're right because I'm in prep and I'm probably wrong. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like, this is so weird. <laughs> Yeah, totally got it, man. All right, so I got I got another question, man. What's what's the biggest like misconception or like things you see on social media about nutrition or training that pisses you off the most? That's a good question. There's a again, we're in this like little niche where I don't think we see like some of the, like I see sometimes someone like Martin McDonald maybe where he's more in like the gen pop like he sees a lot more of like that sort of stuff and new books and like stuff that comes out in the news whereas I don't really look at any of that stuff it's more so like in our like kind of evidence-based capsule so seeing stuff like that uh oh what's a I guess one an easy one to talk about with training is I think a lot of people had the misconception for a long time that progressive overload could only come through adding weight to the bar and that every session you had to add weight to the bar. Whereas now we know there's more like a, a threshold for overload and then you can progress within that. And so as an example, if you do like 10 on hundred for a squat this week, next week, if you do 10 by hundred on the squat, it's not now not overloading. It's still going to produce hypertrophy, maybe not as much as it used to, and if you keep squatting 10 by 100 for months and months and months, eventually it's going to fall out of the overload threshold. It's not going to be hard enough to challenge you to grow. But when we're advanced, you can't expect to be able to just add load forever indefinitely. So I think that's one thing that could be nice. Yeah, that would be like we'd be the strongest person in the world eventually. So that's something that I think people get confused about as a bit of a myth. And then the element of overload as well, where they think oh, progressive overload, because it has a load in the name, people think it has to be weight. But you can add a rep. Um, there's loads of different ways you could like actually progressively overload the body. You could add sets, maybe uh, depending. You could improve your form. You could change the tempo. You could add a pause, things like this as well. So I would say within the training, that's one within our like niche i think there's also a crowd that thinks you have to train to failure every single session and that's one for me that again it's like the threshold we know there's thresholds to meet so if we train close enough to failure we have lots of data to support this now that so long as you're close enough to failure and you're causing an overload you can produce growth so you don't have to train like go to the, like go hard or go home within the gym all the time which is what i used to think in the past and that led to injuries and like, I'd end up actually regressing very quickly because I was just so fatigued all the time. Whereas now we know, ah, oh, we can train like, we need just to train hard enough, meet the thresholds and then progress from there. And we get into this really productive zone of training where we get a lot of stimulus, not for excessive amounts of fatigue. So I'd say there too, that I see with training, nutrition. Oh, I guess some, huh, what would be a nutritional one that I see a myth? Do you have any off the top of your head, Julian, that you see nutrition? Oh man. I bet you've got <laughs> like you can't you can't grow muscle as a vegan, something like that. <laughs> All the time. Uh, that, that's one. Um, artificial sweeteners. Uh, 
Oh yeah. Toxic cleanses, <laughs> fasting. Oh, so many. Carbs, carbs are bad. Yeah. Carbs are bad for you. You gotta stop eating after six p.m. Processed processed foods is a huge one. For, okay. Yeah. Yeah, processed foods. It's like some people, you know, it's like I I don't want to eat processed foods. So it's just like okay, well, I don't know what to tell you, man. Yeah, I uh, think so yeah, people don't realize processed processed foods are a really good one because um. Like in when you do process, like that's part of the reason we become so successful as humans is because we learn how to process foods and get more energy out of foods, like farming and getting rice and crops and being able to make cereals and grains. It's like these have been tremendous for growing us and making us like gain bigger brains and being more successful as a race. So it's like crazy that people think like processing is bad. It's like, well, would you look? like you're not eating raw everything <laughs> like you cook your even like meats or vegetables like and it makes digestion easier you get more nutrients from those sort of things so it's and then i guess it's the i think people get it wrong in terms of they just think processed but there's levels to it so there's like the hyper processed foods but it's even those like they're not inherently i guess good or bad foods is one that always comes up they're not inherently bad it's just moderation of those like how much of a di- of your whole diet do they make do you have a otherwise healthy and productive diet that's the most important thing versus one food yeah i think just not having like a black or black or white approach towards eating because health is just like a myriad of things it's not just eating a processed foods or not it's what everything else you do around that like if you eat a little bit of processed foods but everything else is fine you healthy body weight healthy body fats you move you you know you got good cardiovascular health then you would probably be fine but if you're eating processed foods all the time and fries and you're overweight and you don't train, then you're probably heading towards trouble. So it's just that's that black and white approach that, that yeah. I don't, I don't like, dude. It's like, or if this is typical ones in contest prep, like you have to chop out dairy or like gluten, things like this, just like people are just like, I don't know. Bodybuilding is already quite a restrictive <laughs> thing in terms of, even if you track your macros, like you, you're trying to hit, even if it's just protein and calories, that's more restrictive than eating like otherwise. And then they try and put in all these other restrictions of, oh, you have to avoid uh, I got one artificial for you. sweeteners or- <laughs> I got one for you, man. Um, because there's a lot of bodybuilders that still follow this. It's just having, believing that you need to follow a rigid meal plan, just eat the same freaking thing all the time. And if you don't do that, then you're failing. Yeah, I get, it is this um, element of, I think bodybuilders just enjoy, I think, making things hard <laughs> and making things hard for hard sake is not better. It's, it, and it can very often be worse. So it's, it's like you said, they're kind of like religious to this chicken, rice, broccoli, whatever it could be. That's like your traditional thing or obviously eating I don't know, white fish. Tilapia was the one that like thins the skin or whatever. And sure, like they're decent things to have within a bodybuilding diet like complex carbohydrates you're getting some vegetables some fiber you're getting a lean protein source there's nothing inherently special about those things it's like i don't know a a person saying you have to squat to build your quads it's like well no what's wrong with a hack squat like the body doesn't know what exercise you're doing it just knows mechanical tension through a range of motion the same with nutrition like it doesn't know you're having rice or it's having like something very similar in terms of macronutrients and micronutrients to rice. It just knows it's getting these nutrients within the body. And it's in the, the, uh, the kind of awful thing of that is these same bodybuilders are the ones that will have cheat meals. They're like, oh, I need to have this cheat meal. It's like, how's, is that hardcore as well? Like having this complete cheat, like since when is cheating a hardcore thing to do? Isn't that like breaking the rules and the system and that's an easier route like and they have to like quote unquote have to cheat because they have such an unhealthy relationship with food where they're restricting themselves and they need to have this release whereas for us where we understand macros micronutrients how the body doesn't like know that this is like a clean or dirty food and we hit these numbers we can have a varied diet where we might even be able to include some of the things we love, have a very healthy relationship with food where we can moderate things and enjoy our diet long-term without these cheats. And then ultimately we actually see better results because now we're not like undoing part of our calorie deficit or being in too much of a surplus of one single day and having to like pull back or restrict ourselves and putting ourselves into that unproductive situation. But there are a time and place for meal plans. I think they can be very productive, but having the knowledge that, oh, I don't know, I'm out of, rice today so i can sub in this other thing like Not gonna potato eat today. <laughs> that's fine and white potatoes for the longest time were seen as like a bad food it's like what <laughs> like why <laughs> no sense to it it's just like bodybuilding it's probably coming from point. the 
the war on carbs, like feeling that carbs are bad for yeah. you. But that's another story. But Steve, I really, really enjoyed the chat, man. I really appreciate your time. If someone wants to, well, I'll, I'm going to link your Instagram. But if someone wants to learn more about you, like where else can they find you? Sure. So Instagram Revive Stronger is like the place I'm most active. Then we have our YouTube, uh, Revive Stronger and the Revive Stronger podcast. So we have our own podcast where I get to interview. Lots of great interviews there. So, yeah. People I to do this wildly intelligent. Channel, Oh, amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you want to hear some really kind of in-depth next level stuff, you can listen to that. And the revised, uh, revisedstronger.com is our website. So everything's over there. So that's probably the best place to find our online coaching, our member site, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, it's been fun. Thank you for having me on.